Welcome to the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, continues his six-part series, Who is God?, with the message, Does God Ever Change His Mind? Now, Dr. McGee will share some great truths with us today that will strengthen your confidence in God. So grab your Bible, and while you do, I want to share a letter from a Through the Bible friend listening to the Thai language program. She writes, This last year, I faced a lot of distress and sorrow, but through your teaching from God's Word, I found peace and grew in the Lord in steadfastness. Thank you for showing me that God is the same today as He was yesterday, and He will be the same tomorrow. When my life is spinning out of control, this somehow comforts me. I thank the Lord and ask Him to use my troubles so I may glorify Him to others. Well, isn't that great? Let's pray that God uses our troubles to glorify Him too. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather around your word. Would you reveal yourself today as the great and mighty God that you are? Help us to understand your word and then open our minds and hearts to be willing to obey your spirit's prompt as we apply what we learn to our individual circumstances. We do want to please you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Does God ever change his mind? And in view of the fact that we have to begin somewhere, we're going to begin with the first chapter of James, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light, with whom is no variation, neither shadow of turning. God never changes. He's exempt from any modification whatsoever. Actually, there is no change possible within him. There can be no alteration at all. There is an impossibility of a deviation by one hair's breadth, and this my beloved, is called the immutability of God. God is immutable. God never changes his mind. He can't change. He can't change for better because God is absolute perfection and he fills the universe and There can be no variation in that direction because he cannot be more than he is. And then, my beloved, he could not be worse, nor could he be less. If he were, he'd not be God. It's inconsistent with perfection to have change. Therefore, in the person of God, there is no extension, nor is there any declension whatsoever. There is no transition for better or for worse. This summer I went back to the hometown, as it were, where I grew up and where I was educated, and I didn't recognize the place. I only saw here and there things that reminded me, and the reason was there had been such a change. Why, the entire area around the capital doesn't even look like the same place at all. It was altogether different, if you please. But may I say that the minute that you move out of creation and you begin to talk about God, there's no reason for God to change. He does not have some information today that he did not have yesterday. There is not something that has come his way today that would cause him to alter his plan. There is not something that's unexpected that has come up that has interrupted him in the thing that he was attempting to carry out. There is not something that he did not foresee that has now appeared on the horizon. He knew the end from the beginning, He did not read the morning paper to find out what happened last night. It wouldn't have happened if he had not permitted it. May I say to you, the Scripture has a great deal to say on this 
I'd like to call your attention to several scriptures. In Job, the 23rd chapter, verses 13 and 14, Job makes this observation. But, speaking of God, but he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. For he performeth the thing that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. And then Isaiah had something to say along this line. God spoke through him, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I'm God and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. And then again the psalmist. In one, Psalm 102, verse 27, and several of the verses in this psalm are quoted in the first chapter of Hebrews. Listen to this. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. In other words, God does not learn by experience. He does not have to have experience, and he has not come to the place where he is today because of the experience of the past. He does not make a supreme effort to be God. He doesn't work at this thing. There's no danger of him losing his position. He's not afraid that someone will work around him and get ahead of him. May I say to you, he had all of this from the very beginning. And therefore, there has been no reason for God to change anything in his plan and in his program. And he does not learn. He's never been to school. He does not have a Ph.D. degree. Tell the truth, he doesn't need a Ph.D. degree. He never uses the trial and error method. Colleges today could not teach him anything. However, I think the colleges believe they could. But they could not teach him anything. The fact of the matter is, he could teach some of them something. Experience has not been his teacher. Nothing has happened that has surprised him. He has no new problem today. I read in a magazine, it was a business magazine that a member of the church sent to me, and I was very much interested in it. It's an engineering magazine. I only understood about half what I read. But I did understand this. Changing economic orders present new problems that demand new methods and new solutions. Well, may I say to you that for man that certainly is, is obvious and evident that we're living today in a world that has changed so much that we have to have new solutions to the problems that have come up. But God doesn't have to have, my beloved. This is old hat to him today where we are. A nuclear age did not present him with some intricate or complex program. He's moving right along with a very complex and intricate program, but he knows every detail of it. Now, I want to say this, though, in connection with what we have said, because some might get the wrong impression concerning God. To say that God is immutable and that he does not change his mind does not mean that God is like a stone fence. It doesn't mean that he's adamant. It doesn't mean that there is a stereotype sameness about him. It doesn't mean that there is no flexibility. It doesn't mean a monotonous status quo. May I say to you, immutability is not immobility. If it were, it would be the same as the Greek worship 
they worshipped the three fates. And they were Morah. Morah was the girl that she spun the cord of time. Lachesis was the one that uh, she determined how long it was going to be. And Atropo was the girl that cut it off. She had the scissors. And there's nothing you could do about that. May I say to you, the Greeks thought of that as fatalism. This is not fatalism that we're talking about at all. I want to go to the scripture this morning, and I want us to look at the three classic illustrations that are given in the Word of God concerning the fact that God does change his mind, so it seems. Three, on three occasions, it says that God repented. What does it mean when it says in the Word of God that God repented? Now, I want us to turn to the first one. It's found in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis at verse 6. Let me read this. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Now, we have mentioned before in this series that the Bible uses anthropomorphic terms to speak of God so that you and I can understand him. It speaks of the eye of God. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro in the earth. It speaks of the ears of God. It speaks of the arm of God and the hand of God. But those are anthropomorphic terms. The one, for he says this, he said the one that made the eye, can he not see? The one who made the ear, can he not hear? But I'll be very honest with you. Uh, I'm rather, well, I'm rather stupid in these matters. And I cannot understand how God can hear unless he's got an ear. And if you say that he has an ear, I get the point. It gets over to me that God hears. And I don't know how you can hear without an ear. I have a notion you come in the same bracket. That's the only way we can know. Now there's another set of terms that are used in, in Scripture, and they're known as anthropopathy. There's another big word. Anthropopathy means that psychological terms that refer to man are used of God. It says, for instance... He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. That's a psychological term. It says God laughs. I don't know how you laugh without a mouth, but it says God laughs. It also says that God weeps. It also says that God is grieved. It also says that God repents. Those are the terms that refer to us psychologically. And they are used concerning God so we can understand something about it. Now, after God had created man, and you come to the time of the flood, God said, It repented God that he had made man. Repent means to change your mind. Has God now changed his mind about man? Well, let's look at this for just a moment. God created man and put him in the Garden of Eden. I believe he created him for fellowship, as we shall see Thursday night. There are several other reasons, but one of them was fellowship. And then, since he's a free moral agent, there must be a choice somewhere in that garden. That choice was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, God said at that very time that the very moment you eat of that tree, you're going to die. May I say to you that man ate of the tree. He died. Nowhere along does God change his mind. You come to the time of the flood, and I read here that it repented the Lord. And actually, the word here for repentance, now I looked this up in my Septuagint translation, which is probably better than the, uh, than the original Hebrew here. And the word is different than our word for repentance. It's not metanoia to change your mind. Actually,
actually, in this word, there is a note of grief. And I think that we need to get this. It's so important to get this. God says here, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. It repented the Lord. What do you mean by it? What was it that repented the Lord? Well, let me read verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is what grieved God, the wickedness and the sin of man. Now wait just a minute. Has God changed his mind? I can't find God changed his mind anywhere. What God did do, he said at the beginning, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And if you go into sin, he told, he told Cain that, oh, sin lieth at your door. But you can come to me and I'll extend mercy to you. And God patiently, over a period of 900 years, watched man multiply upon the earth. And he was grieved because no man was coming to him. There was one man. And God says, I've got to stop this while I've got one man. I can't let this go to the next generation. Ham, Shem, and Japheth will not serve me. And for the sake of the race, I must intervene. God didn't change his mind. God always punishes sin. And God will always save the sinner that will come to him. And God did save Noah and his household. And for 120 years, this man was faithful in preaching. And anybody could have got on that ark if they had believed God. But they're a lot of, like a lot of folk today. They just don't believe God. May I say to you, God did not change his mind. What, who had changed? Man had changed. The man that he had created for fellowship has now gone away from God in rebellion. And the natural man, he is an enemy of God. Paul says that this old nature, the flesh, is at enmity with God. And all were enemies of God. They were all going their own, own way into sin. God didn't change. But my friend, God had to destroy man on the earth. And the reason he did is because God never changes. Man had become corrupt. Man had changed. Man had radically changed. And God treated him as he must always treat a lost sinner who will go on in rebellion. He had to judge the earth. The repentance is the changed action because actually God wanted man for fellowship. And that's the reason he had created him. He did not want to destroy him. It's not his will that any should perish. God doesn't, hasn't created man to be lost. He wants to save him. God's never changed from that position. Now we need to put down by the side then of Genesis 6 this story, if you please, or rather this uh, Statement in Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? My friend, you can depend on God doing exactly what he says that he will do. And what you have Here is God sorrowful, yes, but he has not changed his mind. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. God says this was not my original purpose with man. I have not changed I told Adam at the very beginning that in the day he ate thereof, he would die. And any one of his after that, sin was at the door. And if they went on in sin, that I'd have to drive them out from the presence of the Lord. And now there is man multiplying on the face of the earth. 
and man's in rebellion against God. That's what the Tower of Babel was. And then there is one man, only one man left. God intervened graciously and for the sake of future generations in order that he might save man. Now let me come to the second classic incident that we have in the Word of God. You will find it relative to the passage I read this morning in 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, and there it says in verse 11, it, God is speaking now, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments and it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Now Samuel loves Saul. fact of the matter is, Samuel was never sold on David, but he was sold on Saul. And when God came to him and told him, I have rejected Saul, it broke Samuel's heart. He spent all night weeping before the Lord and pleading with God to let this man continue on as king. But now Samuel must go out for God to Saul to meet him. Now I want you to notice the thing that this man saw you as an excuse, and it's a lame excuse. God had commanded him to use surgery on the Amalekites. And if he had only used the surgery... He would have spared his own life, for it was an, an Amalekite that killed him. Eventually, he tried to kill himself, but an Amalekite finished off the job. And had that not been true, if you follow on down, you'll find that the Agagites, the family of the Agagites, were there. And there's always been a question about Judas, always been a question about Herod in this particular connection. But I'm not concerned about the future. I'm concerned here about this present incident where God says, it repented me that I have set up Saul to be king. Now, <clears throat> it was the people who wanted Saul. They demanded him. God acceded to their demands. Now, uh, this man Saul, a great big fella, Scripture makes it very clear he was head and shoulders above everyone else. He was physically, he was a giant. Spiritually, he was a pygmy. He was a midget in things that pertain to God. Now, this man was asked to use this extreme surgery. And like a great man of today, even a great man of preachers today, he soft-pedaled God's message and he spared the people, and he also spared the cattle. Now, the reason God wanted all the cattle and all the booty destroyed, he never wanted his people to get interested in warfare just for the sake of getting rich or getting something that belonged to somebody else. He never would permit that at all. Another reason was that these peoples were eaten up by venereal disease. And that's the reason God would not let his people touch anything in the city of Jericho. We know today. Archaeologists reveal today those people were eaten up. Therefore, God says don't touch it. And I don't want you to get interested in those things. Now Saul, he decided he'd save the cattle. And these people always come up with a pious reason. He said, I'll save the cattle and we'll use some of them as a sacrifice to God. Isn't that a lovely way of doing it? Now will you notice, God says, you go over to Saul, he has disobeyed me. And when Samuel came to Saul, when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel saying, Saul had came to Carmel and he'd moved on out. Uh, Samuel had to go after him. Samuel came to Saul and Saul said unto him, he's a pious fellow. Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. God has just told Samuel he has not performed the commandment. Now this man is like a great many folk today. 
because they partially do what God asks them to do and won't come all out, they think that they're in fellowship with God. And Samuel now is speaking for the Lord. He says, if you have, if you have obeyed God, seems to me like I hear some cows lowing in the distance. What meaneth the bleating of these sheep that I hear? Oh, Saul said, and man, he has a, Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekite. Haven't you heard? I didn't do it. The people did it. He's blaming the people. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen, but for very pious reasons, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. Why isn't he Saul's God? The rest we have utterly destroyed. The question arises, was Saul ever saved or not? I do not intend to answer that this morning, other than to say that our, what my own conviction is, I do not believe that he was saved. I think Saul was absolutely a lost man. He's one of those forerunners of Antichrist who is to come. Antichrist will be religious, you know. And this man is very religious. And this man, Saul, is told now by Samuel. Samuel says, God hath rejected you from being king. And if Saul had been honest and genuine, he would have got in sackcloth and ashes. But did he get in sackcloth and ashes? No. He says, Samuel, I want to keep up a front. I don't want the people to know just how bad I really am. So would you mind going up to worship with me? Let's not let the people know how bad I am. Let's go up and worship God. Samuel says, I'll not go. The man that should have been in sackcloth and ashes wants to put on his royal robes and go up and put up a front. And that is Saul. He's not genuine at all. He's a phony. He's as phony as a $3 bill. He's not real at all. I wonder today how many people in the church are keeping up a front before God. While inside is a festering sow of sin and rebellion against God, and yet, oh, how pious we can be on Sunday. What a front we can put up before everyone else when we should be in sackcloth and ashes. Did God repent? May I say to you, this man Saul goes on with this rebellion. Let me just read. Then he said, listen to Saul's repentance, I've sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. Not my God, thy God. I want to keep up a front. Now listen to this man, Samuel. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he's not a man that he should repent. Oh, God has not changed. God will not accept a phony as a king over his people. To obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Oh, if you would only obey God, he'd bless you. And because you have not obeyed him, he'll judge you. And the reason he will, he never changes. But he is grieved over you. He will weep over you. You break his heart, but you can't change him. May I say that the immutability of God is the terror of the wicked today. And every wicked man would like to believe two things. There is no God. And the second thing, that somehow or another, he's going to break down at the last moment and shed tears, and he won't be able to go through with it. And hell is no reality. And sin will not be punished. He'd like to believe that. But my friend, God does not change. There was a lady in a cult who came down front here several years ago. She says, Dr. McGee, I don't like this business of you. And she did a nice thing. 
she put me with Billy Graham. She says, I don't like this business the way you and Billy Graham does the same thing of preaching the judgment of God for sin. That's the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a God of judgment, God of wrath. Now, the New Testament is a God of love. She was in a cult, I said. You can almost guess what cult it is, can't you? Well, I talked with her for a few moments. I said, look, I want you to look at something. I said, you say that the God of the New Testament is a God of love. The God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath. I said, uh, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. She said, yeah, that's what I was just telling you. He's a God of wrath. I said, yes, but in the Old Testament, he saved the city of Nineveh, the most wicked city of the day, and a pagan city. I said, when you get to the New Testament, you see the Lord Jesus. You say he's gentle, and that he was love. I agree with it. I see him sitting yonder on the Mount of Olives, I see him looking over Jerusalem, and I see him weeping. Why is he weeping? He's saying, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets. How many times I would have gathered you like a mother hand gathers her little children. You would not. Now your house is left unto you desolate. Not one stone shall be left upon another. And I said, Lady, have you ever read the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. when mothers ate their own children. She said, no, I haven't, and I don't want to read it. And I said, you just don't want to face the truth. God has not changed. The one who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah is the one who destroyed Jerusalem, and the one who saved Nineveh is the one today that'll save any man that'll come to him. And the reason is, he never changed. He never changes. God has never changed. That's the terror of the wicked. Why, John 3, 16. Listen to it. Oh, we are always emphasizing God so loved the world. Fine. That he gave his only begotten son. Fine. That's wonderful. We love that. That whosoever believeth in him... Oh, we love that. Should not perish. We don't like that. The reason God gave his son was because mankind was perishing. And without Christ, man will perish. Why? God never changes his mind. Do you think that somehow or another you're going to come up on the blind side of God someday and you'll use some sort of salesmanship? Maybe you have read the book, How to Make Friends and Influence People. Do you think you're going to talk him out of it? I think not. God never changes. I come now to the last. This is a very familiar incident, one that's familiar to all of you. It's the story of Jonah. And there's something very interesting said about Jonah. It says here, and I'm turning now to the third chapter, verse 10, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Now somebody says, we've got you now. It says specifically that God changed. He was going to destroy Nineveh, and he didn't destroy Nineveh. Well, that's true, because he did say it. That was the message that uh, Jonah brought into the city. In the fourth verse, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, why did God send him down to Nineveh in the first place? Well, God tells Jonah finally, And should not I spare Nineveh that great city? The reason that God sent Jonah to Nineveh in the first place was he wanted to spare Nineveh. He wanted to save this wicked, this awful city. And so he sent this man down there. At the very beginning he says, Rise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Try against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Who changed? Now will you notice this for a moment? Did God change? No, my beloved, there is an axiom that God will always judge sin. 
God said to Nineveh, I will destroy you. I'll destroy you. But he wanted to spare Nineveh. And Nineveh, from the king, king on the throne, down to the hovel, down into the slums, they all went into sackcloth and ashes and they cried mightily unto God for deliverance. And you know what God did? God heard them. And God saved them. And you know why he saved them? Because God never changes. When a wicked city will get in sackcloth and ashes and turn to God, God will save that city always. He's never changed. It looked like he changed because he said he's going to destroy the city. But he also said he'd save. And Nineveh turned to God. And God saved Nineveh. And it looked like God had repented, had changed his mind. Let me illustrate that. Had Nineveh continued on in sin, would God have destroyed Nineveh? Well, if you want the answer to it, turn to the prophecy of Nahum a hundred years later when he did destroy the city. For at that time, they did not turn to God. God would have destroyed Nineveh at this time. But the reason he didn't destroy Nineveh is because Nineveh changed, and when a city changes or an individual will change and turn to God, God will save because he never changes. Here's the illustration. Here's a man riding a bicycle into a strong wind. It's holding him back. It's keeping him from going forward, and he's very tired. Now the man turns around, and he goes in the opposite direction, and the wind that was holding him back now pushes him along. Has the wind changed? No, the wind hasn't changed. Blowing the same direction. Well, the wind was holding the man back a minute ago, and now the wind's helping him. It looks like the wind's changed because it's having the opposite effect on the man. Yeah, but friend, it's the man that changed. It looks like the wind changed. But the man changed. God, who never changed. When a man those in rebellion against him will turn to him. He'll always say, I said a moment ago that the immutability of, of God is the terror of the wicked. The immutability of God is the comfort of the child of God. I think one of the loveliest things said about old Jacob, he came to Bethel. And if you read that very carefully, he had a limited view of God. Jacob did. Jacob was surprised that God was at Bethel. He, actually, when he ran away from home and got away from Esau, he shook the dust off his feet and he says, Thank God I got rid of God, too. He's been worrying me. And that night, he says, I'll call this Bethel. God's in this place. And God dealt with him. God made a covenant with him. Now Jacob goes to Haran. A quarter of a century goes by. And for Jacob, it was a checkered sort of thing. Oh, it was terrible. Well, I suppose God's going to get rid of him. When he came back into the land, will you listen to this? And this is so wonderful. God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. And make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Back to Bethel, Jacob. Back to Bethel. I haven't changed. I'm right here. I'm right here to meet you and to greet you and to bless you. How wonderful he is. Our Lord told the story about a father waiting for a boy that had run away. The father never changed. He loved the boy. And one day the boy changed. And he came home, and when he did, the father ran to meet him. And the old Scotch commentator says, that's the only time God ever got in a hurry. <laughs> he ran to meet him. He ran to meet him because God never changes. 
It fortifies my soul to know that though I perish, truth is so, that howsoever I stray and range, whate'er I do, thou dost not change. I steadier step when I recall that if I slip, thou dost not fall. I have a God today I can depend on. He can't depend on me, but I can depend on him. He'll never change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same today as he was the day he hung on the cross. He didn't work himself up into some great emotional pitch to die on the cross. When he died on that cross, it was the expression of the same love he has this morning for you. And he'll never turn against you. Never. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and even Malachi said to his people, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Well, my friend, he knew the day he saved you that you were going to fall, so he made arrangement for it. And he says to you and to me, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your, your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But if this morning you are here without him, don't lean today on that paper wall that somehow or another he's going to change and receive you after all. He changes not. He changes not. And because he changes not, he'll save you if you come to him. What a great lesson. Now, although it's difficult to understand God's immutability, isn't it reassuring to know that it's true? You know, God never changes. We can be confident in his promises and for his love for his children. If you've missed a message in this great series called Who is God or any of our Sunday sermons, they're all available at ttb.org. And while you're there, why don't you check out the many great Bible study materials, including Dr. McGee's booklet download titled God So Loved. You may recognize that phrase from John 3.16, For God So Loved the World. Well, this booklet takes you deeper into all that it means. You'll discover the heights, depths, width, and length of God's love for the whole world and the special love that he has for his children. Why don't you download your free copy at ttb.org today, or you can always call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And speaking of deepening your study of God's Word, do you know about our weekday study of Through the Bible? Well, we're in John's third letter this week, and then we're back in the Old Testament book of Nahum. Please join us in these great half-hour studies. You can listen in a lot of different ways. You can do it by podcast, by app, online at ttb.org, and of course, on this station too. Now, the Bible bus runs on a five-year loop, and you can get on and off at any time. So listen online and see if your station carries the daily program. Visit us at ttb.org. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, and for all of us at Through the Bible, we're praying that you experience God's love and grace in a deeper way as you study His Word and walk with Him each day. Jesus made it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Join us each weekday for our five-year daily study through the whole Word of God. Check for times on this station or look for Through the Bible in your favorite podcast store and always at ttb.org.